Thank you so much for joining us for the, our first art aperitif. Emily Bannis, Assistant Curator of Decorative Arts and Design, will be walking us through vessels for storing, serving, and sipping wine and spirits. So thank you so much, Emily, for your time today. Let me also say that if any internet issues um, arise, we're just gonna sit tight. People may disappear and come back. Hopefully that's not Emily, but if that happens, we are here for you and we'll take it from there. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for joining me tonight um, for this first um, art aperitif. Um, and the title of this program is particularly relevant to tonight's discussion because we're going to be looking at vessels for storing, serving, and drinking wine and spirits. And an aperitif is an alcoholic beverage, such as um, a type of cocktail, sparkling wine, or a spirit that is served before a meal to open the palate and stimulate the appetite. So whatever your drink of choice is tonight, I hope this program will provide an enjoyable transition from your workday to dinner time and give you something new to think about. The contents for tonight's program came out of research that I've been doing on the Gora Manufacturing Company's use of glass. So this program is a bit skewed towards Gorham, um, but I, I happen to think that these are some of the best examples of these types of objects that we have in the collection. So with that, I want to begin first with this wine decanter set. This was made by the Gora Manufacturing Company in 1865. And when we think about vessels for holding liquids, we're typically talking about glass, sometimes ceramic, um, but mostly glass. And there are a lot of benefits to using glass. It's very thermally stable, meaning that it can keep the temperature of its contents consistent. And it's also inert, which means it's not going to react with any of the substances that you put in them. So whatever you're storing in glass, it won't pick up any undesirable smells or tastes. And I think we can all agree that it's also beautiful. Um, having something like this to showcase a, a beautiful wine um, on your side table uh, is, is a really um, attractive way to showcase uh, the type of wine uh, that, you're, that you have. So Gora manufactured silver and bronze, not glass. Uh, so they purchased glass from a number of companies, both nationally and internationally, including Baccarat and Corning, um, and also local glass manufacturers in Rhode Island. So we're gonna take a close look at this design, but first I just wanna say, um, why, why would we decant wine? And the decanting process uh, simply entails pouring wine from one vessel into another. And this is usually done for two reasons. One, to let the wine breathe. Some of you might be familiar with that idea. Um, decanting aerates the wine. Um, when it comes into contact with oxygen, it helps open up the aromas and the flavors of the wine. And as you'll see in the photo here, if some of you um, are familiar with Downton Abbey, you'll see this fantastic contraption for decanting the wine. Um, this process also helps remove uh, any of the sediment that naturally accumulates as the wine ages. And this is something we don't really encounter very much today as we're, we're used to drinking um, wines that are filtered and consuming them soon after we've purchased them. So you'll see this isn't something that we do a lot today, but um, back in the 19th century, wine bottles were not the standard um, attractive glass bottles with the beautiful labels that we see today. They came in a variety of shapes and sizes, and they certainly weren't something that you would want to bring out and show your guests, especially if you had a beautiful crystal pitcher to decant your wine into. So these are some of the reasons that we might decant wine, um, and some people still do today. I particularly love the design of this decanter set though. It's such a contrast to a lot of the silver designs that you would see during this period that have, you know, flowers or scrolling ornaments. Um, and as with 
uh, many objects that Gora made, and we'll see this a bit later, the designs of the objects usually relate to what the object would be used for, sometimes in a very literal way. Um, so here we have this great center design with these satyrs, and satyrs are these half, these um, mythological half man, half goat like creatures that are known for being drunken, lustful. Um, they're known for their love of wine, dancing, and women. <laughs> So this gives you an idea of what you might expect when you partake in the contents of these bottles. And of course, Gorham, um, they're always thinking about design and the practical uses of their objects. So um, if you can see these little rings um, right here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, so those would have been used to hold the tops of the bottles um, securely when you're pouring your wine. So you won't have the bottle tops rolling all over the table. That's certainly not attractive. Um, so functional, but also really fun object. And of course, uh, made around the same period is this Gorham ice bowl. And so when you think of ice, you're not necessarily thinking of um, vessels for wine and spirits, but of course um, ice is something we take for granted today. A lot of us make ice, so we get ice when we um, uh, go out to a restaurant someday, when we'll go out to restaurants again. Um, but ice was really a luxury in the 19th century, and in the early 19th century, a Bostonian native named Frederick Tudor, who became known as the Ice King, um, perfected the process of harvesting ice in New England and shipping it worldwide. And this was used to preserve food as well as medicine in the days before commercial refrigeration. And in order to expand his business profits, Tudor suggested that people use ice to cool their beverages. And he would often give samples of ice to bartenders to serve chilled drinks to their customers to really get them hooked on using ice for themselves. Um, the, the iconography of this bowl relates not only to expeditions that were happening in the north during this time, but that it also reflects um, America's borders changing with the purchase of Alaska from Russia in 1867. And you can see that the images on this bowl are all about ice all about things that are cold. You have these great winter scenes, icicles and polar bears. So all things that relate to ice and um, what you might use this object for. Now, although Gorham purchased fully finished bottles uh, to use in their silver holders, they would also embellish glass in a variety of ways, and one of them was through silver deposit. This process, um, actually one that Gorham patented in the 1890s, um, entailed using an electric current to deposit silver particles onto the glass, um, which was coated in a material to attract the silver particles, um, and then painting a resist varnish on the object and doing the process in reverse um, to reveal this great design. So it allowed you to really encapsulate um, an object in a silver um, design and we get things like this. These are um, whiskey decanters. These were actually purchased from the Glenlivet Distillery in Scotland. And there's really no practical purpose for decanting whiskey. So these bottles are really all about looks, um, but still with a design function, because as we can see in the object on the left, um, it has images of thistles, and I wish we had a, a closer up image, so I hope you can see, um, at least at the top, um, it has thistles, which are the national emblem of Scotland, and this likely indicates that this object was used for Scotch whiskey. And the object on the right has images of grain, and it was likely used for rye whiskey. So two, two interesting uh, design motifs there. 
Of course, the design didn't always relate to the contents. We have this uh, other great whiskey bottle made by Gorham, and this is actually two sides of the same bottle. Um, it's got this great marine scene on it. Um, so just uh, another cool design element that, that Gorham was making during the period. I want to jump ahead uh, a couple decades into the 1920s. It has been a hundred years since prohibition started, um, since prohibition was introduced in the United States in 1920, and it lasted until 1933. And during that time, it was not necessarily illegal to drink alcohol, but alcohol was prohibited. Uh, the manufacture, transport, and sale of alcohol um, was prohibited at that time. But as we know, drinking still took place in speakeasies and private residences. And alongside prohibition really grew this cocktail culture. And this inspired new designs um, in everything from dresses to glassware and design conscious consumers drinking at home had many stylish options to choose from. I particularly love this uh, martini glass on the left. This was made by uh, the Austrian architect and designer Joseph Hoffman. He designed just about everything from buildings to chairs to flatware and glassware. And um, on the right, we have a beautiful 1920s cocktail glass. And martini glasses are often confused um, in shape with cocktail glasses, which makes sense because the martini glass design developed from the cocktail glass shape. The uh, cocktail glasses are slightly smaller, they're more rounded, um, and as, as you can see on the left, the long stem of the glass is really to keep your hand away from the bowl of the glass so that it doesn't warm up your drink, um, similarly with a stemmed wine glass. And on the right, you have um, sort of a stem, a version of the stem with an elongated uh, foot that would serve the same purpose. Although vessels for mixing alcohol can be traced back for centuries, the modern cocktail shaker was invented around the mid 19th century. And a lot of patents emerged which modified the design and the shapes and straining capabilities um, into what we know of cocktail shakers today. And during Prohibition, cocktail shaker designs took off in a really fun way. Um, there were shapes such as airplanes, lighthouses, and penguins. And you're probably wondering, why am I not showing you penguin cocktail shakers? Um, well, it's always interesting to see what your research reveals um, in your own collection. We don't actually own a cocktail shaker at the RISD Museum, which was a surprise. So. Here I have a design instead for a cocktail shaker set. This was made by the Danish designer, Eric Magnussen, who worked at the Gora Manufacturing Company um, from 1926 to 1929. And it's got kind of this, um, I would say, maybe a faux lighthouse shaped design. It's got some waves at the bottom. Um, I don't know if the set was ever actually produced, but it is very similar to designs that we know that Eric Magnussen did produce. But I just thought that was kind of a fun, fun fact. The culture of dining and entertaining really changed drastically between the First and Second World Wars. Multiple course dinners that required different pieces of flatware were no longer sustainable in a country that was facing food shortages and rationing. And a new culture of informal dining and entertaining really emerged during this time. And there were a lot of books and magazines that were there with helpful tricks to help navigate this new culture with ease. And one of them that you'll see here on the right was originally published in 1950. And it's still in print today, which I think is really interesting. It, it has a lot of the, it really resonates today um, with how we design and set up our homes. Um, designers Russell and uh, Mary Wright wrote Guide to Easier Living to help 
really the modern man and woman organize their homes and their lives for maximum efficiency and comfort, um, something that I think a lot of us could still use today. And of course, Russell Wright being a very prolific designer in the mid-century designed lots of household items that of course could aid you in your easier living journey. So we have this wonderful set of Eclipse glasses. Um, the Wrights had many successful lines of glassware, um, ranging from fun and casual. Uh, perhaps these could be used at your outdoor barbecue. Um, and they have sizes for really um, particular types of cocktails. So we have the small little cordial glass, the highball glass, um, an old fashioned and the tall glass is called the zombie. And I think that refers to a fruity cocktail that was called the zombie, um, but, but I'm not entirely sure. He also designed uh, lines of colored stemware in case you wanted something with a hint of elegance. And what I think is really interesting is that while having different flatware for every dish and every ingredient really fell out of fashion, um, when we decided that you no longer need a fish fork to eat a fish course, a dinner fork is just fine, um, and you no longer need a fruit knife to cut into your cantaloupe, um, we really retained all of these different shapes of glassware for our specific types of drinks. So, in case you thought that beer was forgotten during this, it wasn't. Uh, this tall uh, glass right at the top here is actually a Pilsner glass, and it was for a Pilsner or a light beer. Um, similar to a champagne, you want to be able to see the carbonation in your beer, and it also held uh, the foamy head of the beer close to your nose, so you could have that aroma while you were drinking. Um, similarly with wine glasses, the shape really um, opens up the wine, lets it breathe, as I mentioned before, um, and really enhances the aroma. Um, the cordial glass, this little tiny guy right here, um, for a very strong and sweet liqueur after dinner, you want just a little bit of it. So you're not going to pour it in your wine glass, you're probably going to pour it in a size glass that's appropriate for the drink that you want. So I just think that's kind of an interesting thing about, about glassware. You know, a lot of us, even if we don't have a whole range of glassware for different types of cocktails, you know, we'll usually have at least a, a wine glass or maybe, you know, a champagne glass in our home for, for those particular drinks. And if you're going out to a bar, you're not going to get a martini in a beer glass, at least not that I've seen. <laughs> And um, we talk a lot about um, mass production and inexpensive materials during the mid-century. Um, but one of these uh, objects that I really love is this ice bucket. It's actually handmade uh, by Danish craftsmen um, using 48 pieces of a hundred-year-old Siamese teak. This is per their advertisement for the ice bucket. And um, in case you didn't think you needed a new ice bucket, uh, this one has high impact polyethylene, which insulates it and keeps your ice really cold, or it also keeps food hot. So as we see here, this advertisement boasts that this ice bucket can hold 70 ice cubes or 120 hot Swedish meatballs. And if that's not enough for you, the bigger size ice bucket on the right can hold 140 cubes of ice or four quarts of stroganoff or six ears of corn. So, so kind of selling this as a multi-purpose, multitasking, you know, object for your party. <laughs> So I started with Gorham. I think it's only appropriate that I end with Gorham. Um, the post-World War, uh, post-World War II really solidified a lot of the lifestyle changes that had been slowly taking shape. And silver was really waning in popularity um, at this time when Americans were turning to 
aluminum and chrome, which was less expensive and also easier to care for. Um, but Gorham continued to adapt by offering objects in silver plate, which was less expensive than sterling, um, and with plastic handles, which were also less expensive than wood, um, but in the popular biomorphic shapes of the time. And in addition to the cocktail shaker, the pitcher also saw a rise in popularity for easy entertaining. So instead of shaken cocktails, um, mixed drinks could easily be served in this beverage server and the long handled spoon inside, um, known as the stirrup spoon, uh, could stir up your cocktails and you could easily serve them to your guests. So it's a simple, elegant object, um, one that I really love. So we went from more ornate to a little bit more simple. Um, and I'm gonna end it there.